Hi, everyone, and welcome to Turn It In, the ins and outs for students. This is a Light Center workshop brought to you by myself, Dr. Danny Pelliquin. I'm the librarian here at Westcliff University, and we're going to spend the next 35 to 45 minutes together talking about how to use Turn It In to improve our research and our writing. Today, we're going to start with going over some Turn It In basics. We're going to really situate ourselves in the purpose of what Turnitin really is. It's not a plagiarism tracker or checker, uh, despite what some of us may think. We're also going to talk about how it can be used to get feedback from your professors, how we can use that feedback to support our writing and the development of our writing. Then we're going to spend some time understanding what the similarity report is, and that is what most people believe to be this idea of a plagiarism checker or plagiarism tracker, but we're going to really understand what its purpose is. And then we're going to understand how we can use it to improve our writing. How can we support our writing, identify areas of improvement with the similarity import report in hand? And then last but not least, we're going to go through some aspects of Turnitin that can help us advocate for ourselves in the classroom. We want to remember that our professors are using Turnitin as a tool the same way that we are. And many times they have as much information about Turnitin as we do. And we can use our similarity reports, we can use their feedbacks in ways to advocate for ourselves in the classroom and to make sure that we're getting the support we need in our writing. But before we start any of that, I want to go over why. Westcliff University chose Turnitin as a tool. As I said, it's not a plagiarism tracker or a plagiarism checker. And because of that, there are some misunderstandings about what Turnitin really is. Why we chose Turnitin is, boils down to these th four big points. The first is to uphold academic integrity. We really want to make sure that we are researching and producing academic works that are important but also that support academic integrity. They support us in understanding what research is. And in addition, they uphold our honor code, our honor code and make sure that we're adhering to APA standards and other sound and healthy research practices. We also chose Turnin because it allows for us to have a robust kind of feedback network. In addition to a box or into an email. Turnitin has multiple ways that we can engage with our professor's feedback so that we can improve our writing over the larger scale of not just a paper or a course, but an entire semester or your entire time here at Westcliff. Turnitin also supports metacognition. Metacognition is the way that we think about thinking. Through feedback from both our professors and from the similarity report built into Turnitin, we're getting a lot of information on how we think and how we research. And we can then use that information to better research and in a certain way to better think about research. And last but not least, tied to that idea of academic integrity, it also supports healthy research practices. We'll see through the similarity report how this tool can call out ways in which we can improve our research, ways that we can improve citations and the use of different kinds of resources, and how we can, how we can improve the overall understanding of what it is that we're researching and the delivery of that research. To start, we have some Turnitin basics. We're going to talk about how to access the similarity report, which is a tool that is of great importance. In addition to the similarity report, we're also going to talk about opportunities for feedback, where your professors are going to be giving you feedback, how you can engage with that feedback, and what it means when they use certain tools for feedback. So at this point in time, you're more than welcome to continue watching the video or you can pause it and you can pull up your own class and your own similarity report based upon how you best learn. Some would rather just watch this and take notes and pull up their own similarity report later, while others may choose this time to pause the video, go into your gap, download one of your uh, assignments, and then use that similarity report for the portion that we're going to go forward with. Once again, we're going to touch on the similarity report and how to access it, and then we're going to transition over into accessing feedback. Then after we talk about feedback, we'll go back to that similarity report and talk about how we can use that to improve our writing. So at this point in time, if you want to pause, please follow these steps ahead of time to make sure that you are grabbing that similarity report, the one that's most meaningful to you.
The first thing you're going to do is you're going to click on the assignment in GAP. So locate the course that you're interested in. Click on that course. You have to have uploaded the assignment in order for there to be a similarity report produced. So click on the assignment in GAP that you're interested in looking at that similarity report for. And then you're going to find the colored band, which is circled here. It's going to have a percentage. And then next to that percentage, it's going to have a color, typically red, green, yellow, um, blue, or orange. There has to be a percentage and a color in this space that's circled on this slide in order for there to be a similarity report. If there isn't, it may say pending, which means that the similarity report is still loading, or it may not have anything listed there, which means that the similarity report has not been processed. If there isn't anything there in the band or in the percentage, be sure to re-upload your paper to make sure that you can get that similarity report. Because Turnitin is checking the similarity with so many different databases, both online and through various journals, it may take a minute. So if you're trying to upload something immediately and use it right now during this workshop, please give yourself at least 10 to 15 minutes for Turnitin to produce that similarity report. After an hour, if it has not been produced, then go back in and make sure that it's no longer pending and that the file was actually correctly uploaded. If you have your email attached to Turnitin, your Turnitin account, it will email you letting you know that the similarity report has been generated. Once you see this percentage and the colored band noting that the similarity report has been generated, you can open the report by clicking on that colored band. So in this case, this student, this is a test one, and as you'll see, it says 100% similarity, and we'll talk about what that means. But in order to access this one, they would click on that red band, alerting them to the fact that their paper has matched with great similarity to other papers. Now I want to jump a little bit to this idea of feedback. What Turnitin does, and the way that I like to think about it, is Turnitin is a holistic way to, to gain feedback. The similarity report is a kind of feedback. In no way does it mean that you have completely plagiarized, that you're going to get a zero, or that you're going to fail, though that can occur based upon a Turnitin report. It in no way is, the, a, is one data point. We're never going to use just Turnitin as a way to say you have plagiarized and therefore have failed. There, we will always do as professors some extra digging. And there's time and space in this process for you to advocate for yourself and make it known that there are certain issues that arose during your research and certain ways that you're going to fix that. Additionally, if we look at Turnitin as a tool for feedback, we can see that the similarity report is just one of many ways that we can gain feedback through Turnitin. The four big ways are listed out here, and we'll go through them one by one with screenshots. I'm sure you've experienced some of these, so if you have, please bear with us, as I'm sure that there are other ones that are new to you. Starting with the rubric, this is used by your teachers, and typically um, this will be completed, and you'll be able to look at it, and it will correspond to a score or grade in your gradebook. And we'll look at what that means and how we can get feedback from that. Additionally, there's a tool called Quick Marks, and this will just produce a short phrase or word that relates back to a certain kind of feedback that a professor sees very often. Typically, this is going to be something about like subject verb agreements, improper citations, something that students struggle with on a regular basis. Embedded comments are ones that are put directly onto your PDF file. So when you upload a document into Turnitin, it's going to turn that into a PDF, and your professor can put embedded comments directly in line on that PDF. And we'll talk about why that's important and how that differs from this last piece of feedback, which is bubble comments. Bubble comments are going to correspond to a highlighted piece of your paper, typically just a sentence or maybe even a phrase that your professor will then attach a comment to about that specific sentence or phrase. So let's take a minute and go through these four different pieces so we can see what it is that they look like and why it's important that we use and access all of them. When you're in Turnitin, when you've clicked on that, um, that band color, it will bring up your paper on the left-hand side. It's going to be a, a pretty large window on the left-hand side that has your original paper. And then there'll be a menu on that right-hand side. The top section of that menu is going to be blue, and it's going to have a couple different buttons on it. 
And then below that is a menu that's going to be red and have a couple different buttons. At this point, when we're talking about feedback, we're going to be focusing on that blue menu. As we move and talk about the similarity report, we're going to be focusing on that red menu. So at this point in time, the first thing you'll want to do is in that blue menu, it's going to have a banner that says instructor feedback, as shown here on the top right. And you're going to want to click on view rubric. The majority of your papers and assignments will have a corresponding rubric. They exist both in the syllabus for you to refer back to and in Turnitin that will be used for grading. Here you'll see the completed rubric and the highlighted boxes are the ones that your professor selected based upon your assignment. So we see here that the professor selected a 6 out of 10 for content, an 8 out of 10 for research, a four out of 10 for application, and a four out of 10 for punctuality. Now, what's really important about this rubric is that we go through and we read it with great intention so we can understand how we can improve our writing and how we can improve our research. So if we notice here that there's room for growth in really all of these different domains, we can read what it takes to be a 10. What does it mean to get 10 out of 10 in all of these areas? From there, we can go back to our paper, we can look at it and assess where we are currently and where we need to be in order to get that 10. We can then make those changes and upload as a final draft, or if the final draft has already been uploaded, we can use that information to better inform our future assignments. So whenever you get a grade and turn it in, before you rush to your professor and say, what did you think? How can I improve? What can I do? Go to the rubric first, identify where those blue boxes are, which is where you currently sit, and then look at where you want to be. Maybe, maybe a 10 is a little bit hard right now. Maybe you just want to shoot for an eight in certain areas. So then you'll read the eight boxes and figure out where you currently are based upon the shaded block boxes and where you want to be based upon those, those target goal boxes. In addition to rubrics, as I said, there's a quick marks. Once again, these come from that blue menu. And what you'll notice is this is going to relate to a specific word or phrase. Sometimes that word or phrase is highlighted. Sometimes it is just put as an overlay on top of your paper. But typically what is going to appear are one or two words or phrases that relate back to common student errors. As we see here, um, one on the right is that it, there's missing quotations, and the one on the left says it's missing citations needed. We call this canned feedback and that it's not your professor specifically writing about your specific topic in this specific sentence. They're giving you feedback more about something that was missed or overlooked when you were writing your paper. It's canned because the responses in those pop-ups give you an additional amount of information so that you can really focus on improving your writing, but that information does not come directly from the professor. Instead, that has been input by Turnitin. So while the professor is leaving these comments, leaving where it is that there is additional support needed, what is put into these pop-ups is not written by the professor, but instead by another source based upon common student errors. By no means does this mean that you can disregard these comments. It's incredibly important because common mistakes happen all the time. And while your professors may not take them into consideration at certain times as the semester goes on, as your coursework goes on, and as you progress from COM 102 to those higher level bachelor's and doctorate classes, common student errors will be deducted and taken into consideration in your grades and in the rubric. Embedded comments are another kind of feedback. And as you'll see here, these typically are not aligned with anything that is highlighted. Um, instead, these are words or phrases that are put directly onto the PDF by your professor. So these are not canned. And usually professors will use embedded comments for larger scale issues. So it may be an issue regarding formatting or verb tense or the construction of an entire paragraph is off. And therefore they're going to use embedded comments. They use this because it has a larger ramification as opposed to what we'll see in the bubble comments, which are di comments directly based on a specific word or phrase. 
So here we see that this is based upon larger aspects of your paper. Maybe you didn't include supporting details, and therefore there's going to be an embedded comment about remember to have a supporting detail in each paragraph, or remember to indent X, Y, and Z. These headers are, are not APA format. So these are going to be much larger issues that, are, that have less to do with specific content and more to do with the overall paper that you are delivering and uploading. Bubble comments are the most specific because these include and are attached to a word or phrase similar to those quick marks, but the information that's put into that bubble that pops up is by the professor. So this is direct feedback input by the teacher and it's related to a specific highlighted section. When you click on this little text speech box, it will open up to that larger comment. You won't see the comment directly on your PDF because this isn't an embedded feedback, this is a bubble comment, so you will have to click on that speech bubble. But from there, your, your professor will explain what it is that specifically is occurring in that sentence or phrase that needs to be worked through. Maybe the sentence is just a little bit clunky, maybe it doesn't fit with what, with what you're trying to say, maybe it appears to link to a thesis statement, but in actuality it doesn't completely land. So this is going to be much more specific feedback, not on your overall paper, but on your specific sentences or even word choice. So now that we know where we can find professor left feedback, and now that we know how we can access a similarity report, let's try to understand a bit more about what this similarity report is and how it's used. Once again, it is going to tell you what sources are similar to your written paper. So in that way, many people think of it as a plagiarism tracker or a plagiarism checker. Um, however, we want to take a larger view of the similarity report and understand that really what it's telling us is how to improve our writing and our research. So before we can dig into why and how we use it, let's understand what it is in general. So the similarity report really just gives us a list of matching and or highly similar texts to what is found in your submitted paper. So it's not going to say this was taken at this point in time from here and therefore there was malicious intent and this student meant to use this other person's words. No, instead it's just going to say these phrases have been used by Khan Academy. This paragraph shows up in smarthistory.org. So what we need to be able to do is parse out both acceptable and unacceptable kinds of similarities. And that's what we're going to do in this next piece. Turnitin al alerts us to the similarity, but we have to do greater investigation. And while our professors can do that, the responsibility really is ours to make sure that we are having acceptable and healthy similarity as opposed to unacceptable and unhealthy similarity. So let's look at what those two things mean. Here are four examples of what would be included in acceptable similarity. Acceptable similarity are statements that are properly quoted and they have citations. Turnitin is going to alert and say, hey, this comes from another source. And if it's acceptable, if we have the quotations around it, if we have that citation at the end, we're going to say, thank you, Turnitin. That's exactly what I wanted to happen. This is proving that I did my research correctly. Similarities can also be triggered based upon references or bibliographies. If you're using a text that's used by a number of different people, let's say it's foundational in business or foundational in education, it may trigger a similarity because so many people are writing about Dewey in regards to education, or maybe even possibly Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos in regards to business. So sometimes that can be triggered even if it's not plagiarized. Short phrases that are commonly used in writing can often trigger a similarity report, such as based on upon this research or as shown by this article. These are words that we all use in our kind of academic and scholarly writing. And sometimes Turnitin can identify those and say, hey, this was taken from another source, but we know that really it's just academic writing in general. And last but not least, formatting consistencies. We are an APA school, and many times Turnitin may say, oh, running header, um, you left that in there, and now it says running header, and that is similar to all these other APA papers that have been submitted. Um, additionally, you may write abstract or introduction, and it may trigger a similarity report because those are based upon other kinds of formatting templates.
So these are all acceptable kinds of similarities. And we just need to make sure that we identify those and we express them to our professors. If our professors come up and say, hey, by the way, you have an 18% similarity, we want to make sure that we're looking at that report and seeing what is triggering that similarity. And sometimes it's these four things. On the right hand side, though, we have unacceptable similarity. I would say six, six out of 10 um, similarity reports bring back unacceptable similarity. Now, once again, this does not mean that is intentional plagiarism. It just means that there's something that needs to be investigated further and some issues that need to be rectified. Unaccepted plagiarism includes taking statements from another source and not citing them properly. So maybe you put in the wrong last name, the wrong citation, the wrong name of a, of a paper, or maybe you don't put in anything at all and you kind of make it seem like it was your work. That's unacceptable similarity. A text that's not quoted, even though it's a direct quote. So maybe you copied and pasted something from an article about Bill Gates and you put it into your own work, but you didn't provide a direct quote stating that it's from Bill Gates or it's from this journalist or it's from this article. That's unacceptable as well. Chunks of text that have been copied and pasted directly from one source into your paper is also unaccepted similarity. And last but not least, you can self-plagiarize. So reusing your own paper in a different class is considered plagiarism and that will trigger a similarity report. Because we use Turnitin across all of our classes. If you turn something in for a comm class on basics of writing, and then you decide to use that same paper in a different class, Turnitin will flag that similarity. Now, that isn't to say that drafts shouldn't be used. You absolutely should be producing numerous drafts, putting those drafts through Turnitin, gaining feedback from the similarity report and from your professors before you turn in that final draft. But there are ways to make sure that when you submit multiple drafts, it doesn't trigger a similarity report or, a, or an unacceptable similarity. And we'll talk about what that looks like. So how do we know when something is similar? Well, as I said, when you click, when you see that um, band color that you're going to click on in order to access your similarity report, that's going to give you a view into what your similarity percentage is. So as we can see here, from zero to 5% um, is, is blue. That basically means that there's no real matching text in here. Nothing is pulled from another source. Even academic language is different. Um, anything that's going to show up from six to 24% is going to show up as green. Typically this means that there's maybe a word or a phrase. Once again, probably some academic normal language that we all use because we're all writing those scholarly papers and really no big cause for concern. Once we get into the yellow and especially into the orange and red, that's when we really want to start digging deep into the similarity report to understand why it's bringing back this similarity. Now, a lot of times students will ask me, what is the threshold, right? What, what triggers into this is now a plagiarized paper? And the answer, as, as exists in so much of higher education, is it depends. Each class, sometimes each assignment, will have its own similarity threshold. So if something is supposed to be a reflection on a painting, if you have anything above 10%, that similarity report's going to say to your professor that something isn't your independent thought, your unique independent thought. But on the other side, if we're talking about a literature review that you're building for your dissertation, you're going to have lots of quotes and paraphrasing and summarizing, and you may be hanging out more in that orange space or in that yellow and orange space. So it really does depend. Be sure that you ask your professor ahead of time. Hey, you know, in the past, I've had a similarity report flag for acceptable and unacceptable similarity. Where should I be kind of putting myself? Should I be shooting for that blue or green or is it okay to be in the more yellow and orange? As a rule of thumb, staying in that blue and green is always good. Um, anytime we jump into that orange and red, we know that there's going to be some significant need for revising, rewriting, um, and especially in that red piece, which is 75 to 100%, it could be a cause for failure based upon deeper investigation into that report. So now that we see this color and we can identify that there's a percentage, what do we what do we do with that? Where do we go from there? 
Well, the next thing we want to do is understand what those matches are. So what a similarity report does is it pulls up a list of matches in which your paper has been matched with another source that is not your own. Or um, if it's used across the board, like Turnitin is here at Westcliff, it could be a source that is your own. When we talk about diving deeper and getting into more information so we can really improve our research and writing, what we're talking about is understanding those matches and then identifying where they come from. So the first thing to understanding our matches is when you go to that middle menu, it's a vertical menu. Like I said, the first one is blue and that's going to focus more about on your professor direct feedback. And the second one below that is going to be red. That menu is based upon your similarity report. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to want to click on the number. That number corresponds to the percentage of similarity. So here we'll see that's 44%, which means that this person is probably in the yellow at this point in time. Possibly higher, and it could be in the orange as well. So there are different aspects of this match overview that I want to go over. The first piece you'll see is that large number at the top, and this just gives us the total similarity of all sources combined. So this says 44%. It could be that there are 44 sources used, and each one was used 1%. So we don't really want to jump to any conclusions when we see this number if it's large, especially if we're writing a substantial paper. If you're writing a paragraph or a quick reflection analysis response, and it's under 500 words coming back at 44%, that's going to be really difficult as it's saying that almost half of your paper is not your own work. So once again, we need to think about the assignment before we can think about this percentage. In a larger paper um, where we're using a lot of resources in like a dissertation or a final paper, 44% may not be that bad. But in a smaller paper, in a personal reflection, 44% is going to alert your professor to something that needs greater investigation. Then we'll see that the sources are matched with a specific text from your paper. So what that means is this is where it's going to show you 12% comes from Khan Academy. 32% um, comes from smarthistory.org. So in addition to saying, hey, this was matched with a source, it's going to show us the name of that source. And we'll, when we talk in the next slide, we'll see how that can actually help us. It's also going to give us a list in that starts with the sources that are matched the most frequently over the course of your paper. So it will show that as we see here, 32%. So 32% of the student's paper is matched with that number one source and it will go down in descending order from there. Additionally, we'll see how much of that paper is matched with each source. So while that 44% is saying overall, almost a half of your paper is similar to other sources out there, this breakdown list will show what percentage per source is connected to your paper. Now let's dig a little bit deeper and get a bit more granular about what this match overview gives us. So once we click we previously clicked on the number, that percentage. Now we're going to click on these bars. And what this is going to do is it's going to give us all of the sources, the names of those sources, and the percentage of those sources. So follow along here um, on this slide, or you can use your own similarity report. The first piece that we see here that's indicated with that magenta or pink dot is the specific page or location of the source from which your text was taken. So yes, it's going to say Khan Academy in that overall piece when we look at the 44%, but then it's also going to tell us a sub, where in Khan Academy, Khan Academy, classical artwork perspective. That's exactly where this is taken from. Then if we look at that teal piece, we'll see that it highlights phrases that were taken directly from a source. So in addition to your professors highlighting pieces and providing you feedback on those specific highlighted phrases and words, the similarity report is also going to highlight sections that were taken directly from another source. Once you see that, there's going to be a pop-up or an overlay that presents over your PDF paper. 
And as we can see here, it's going to give us the phrasing of that original source. So um, with the teal, it's showing us what I put in my paper. And in the purple, it's showing us what was given to us from that original source. In this context, it's Writer's Digest. And then from there, we can see that it's actually not just giving us that word or phrase, but it's providing us with a little bit of information on the front hand and a little bit of information on the back end. So it's giving us a context of that original source. One of the things about extracting direct uh, quotes and then not quoting them, so, so taking phrases out of the original context and putting them into your paper, is sometimes they may not grasp the overall context of what the original text is trying to tell us. So because of that, Turnitin makes sure that it provides us with this overall greater context. Now that we know how to identify the similarity, we understand what the matches mean and how we can identify what the matches mean in our paper. Let's talk a little bit about how we can use this to improve our writing. Because at the end of the day, as I said, this is a tool. And the tool isn't meant to be a gotcha. It's not meant to say, hey, um, you know, you plagiarized and therefore we're giving you a zero. No, it's a tool really meant to help us look at what we're writing and help us better improve our writing and our research, not just in general, but our practices as a whole. So there are three ways that Turnitin can really help us improve. The first is it can identify where we need more citations. The second is that it provides us in that overlay with the opportunity to dig deeper into a specific source. So while I may have extracted something and put it into my paper, using that overlay of the original text alerts me to the fact of maybe I didn't get this part right, or maybe that's not what I wanna actually quote and bring into my paper. And last but not least, it actually can proofread for us based upon the manipulation of different kinds of filters. So to start, we're going to start with identifying those um, where citations are needed. So this is a different paper. And as you'll see, uh, various kinds of colored highlighting is used in order to guide where resources are coming from. Now, in some of these, possibly the student has cited at the end of the sentence. And we'll talk about how we can manipulate those filters to make sure that those don't get brought back into, into the similarity report. But in others, we can see that there aren't in text citations. We can use the numbers that are provided here to correspond to the numbers on the right-hand side. So as you can see here in this middle section, we're back on that match overview with the percentage. And we can see that the percentage that's most taken most from that paper or from that's brought most from the original source to the paper is this Lumen Learning. 43% of the student's paper comes from this Lumen Learning, and therefore it's given the tag of one. When we go through, we can identify where the red is in that number one to see what's taken from Lumen Learning. Additionally, we can see the same based upon number two, as we can see here with the pink, number three, as we can see here up at the top, number four, and number five. So this allows us to see where certain text has been taken out of an original text and put into our paper. And then we better know, okay, I need to put in-text citations in this space, or I need to make sure that I put this in quotations because this is a direct quote. So this is just alerting us to how we can better cite in our research. Once we identify, okay, this is coming from that first source, um, for example, here, 28% was taken from Wikipedia. What we want to do is we want to see that this highlighted text shows that the statement that was taken from that original source. When we hover over it, we notice that the original source then appears in a pop-up or as an overlay onto our paper. We want to be able to see this original text because then we can identify which portion of it we used and whether or not that was even an important aspect. So what we can do is we can click on this symbol over here and it will open up the full text of that source. And from there, we can read through. And maybe I do wanna put into direct quotes this piece that I took directly from the source. Or maybe after reading the entire piece, I realize this isn't the most important part. 
I actually cover this elsewhere. I want to take this part from the original source. So by rereading where the sources come from and what the full with context phrases come from, we can better understand what it is that we want to take from those resources and then kind of work our way back and produce those healthy, legitimate uh, in-text citations. And then last but not least is the use of filters. So you may say, you know, Professor Pahokan, this is all great, but when I upload my papers in and I get my similarity report, it comes back and it says that I've plagiarized, but in actuality, I have put quotes in. Well, that's okay. We just need to make sure that we're using the right filters. So once again, we're gonna hang out in that red vertical menu, but this time we're going to click on that filter icon. And here it's going to come up with a number of different filters and settings that we can choose from. And I'm gonna lead us through these right now. Here, if we click exclude quotes, what that does is it identifies anything that's in quotation marks and it doesn't put that in the similarity report. So if you have quoted properly with in-text citations, it will not exist in the similarity report if you use this filter. The next one excludes the bibliography. So once again, like I said, if you're doing a literature review and you're going over something that has been covered numerous times by numerous scholars, you may wanna click exclude bibliography so that your bibliography is not included in that similarity report. And then last but not least is this section, which takes a little bit more definition to it. If we are uh, typically writing those scholarly papers or those, those school papers where we say, in addition to the research shows that, and those similar phrases are being triggered, then we want to use this section to exclude certain numbers of words and or a certain percentage of words. So if we're proofreading to make sure that there's enough independent thought, we want to exclude quotes and then see much, how much the similarity report brings back. If we want to proofread to make sure that things are quoted correctly, then we want to exclude the bibliography so that we can see based upon the words and the percentage. If we want to make sure that we have original thought across the board, then we want to clear all these filters and make sure that they're all free and filter out nothing. Now, if we want to exclude formatting issues, such as the idea of a running header, an abstract, an introduction, then we want to put in this section five words, because typically over five words is a phrase that is individual to a, to a resource or to a source. Under five can just be a name, our name, common phrases. So a lot of times we want to exclude sources that are less than five words, because those are just normal things that we say. Then we want to either apply changes, which will produce a similarity report with those applied changes, but I prefer to choose a new report. And when you click new report, it makes an entirely new similarity report. And from there, that becomes very helpful because you can give both to your professor and say, hey, you said that I plagiarized. I took these things from these various sources. I actually went through and cleaned up um, where the quotes are, the bibliography. I made sure that I took out some of that um, similarity that was flagged based upon formatting. Here's the previous similarity report. This is 44%. And based upon the filters, here's the new similarity report. This is 7%. And your professor is going to say, oh, thank you so much for doing that work for me. I really appreciate it. Um, and then the case is closed. The investigation is over. So speaking about communicating with your professors, um, let's talk about how we can use Turnitin to advocate for ourselves using all of these facts. So first things first is just a reminder that similarity doesn't mean plagiarism. It means that something is wrong, um, but it doesn't, that needs further investigation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anything has been plagiarized. If we see from this article here, while this student does need to cite some areas here and here, it came back as 78% plagiarized. 63% of the paper is from this source, Smart History. Now, one professor could look at this and say, this is a completely plagiarized 0%. But if I dig a little bit deeper, what I notice is that I ask the students to write a reflection and include the original article on which they're reflecting. So I said, find an article from smarthistory.org, include that article, and then write a reflection. 
So that 63% actually isn't alerting to something bad. It's alerting to something good. It's telling me that the student did what I asked them to. In addition to this reflection, which does need some citations, they included their original source. So once again, making sure that when we see that high number, we're going back to the prompt. What is the prompt asking me for? Did it ask me to pull this? Did it ask me to include something that could be triggered as plagiarized? And last but not least, I have a couple of scenarios where we can use Turnitin to better support us and better communicate with our professors and to our professors the process that we're going through in writing and researching our papers. The first is that sometimes a similarity report can come back as very high if a student submitted a, a draft in the past. So as I said previously, if you put it in a first draft, in a second draft, in a third draft, by the time you get to that final draft, it's going to come back as 100% similar because you've put in so many drafts previously. However, there's a way that your professor can protect against that. And that's by asking them on their end, in their filters, to exclude previous submissions. So if you said to, if the professor said to you, I want to see three drafts of this paper, and then said, oh, it's 100% plagiarized, say, hey, when you get to that final draft, do you mind excluding previous uh, submissions so it doesn't get flagged based upon my previous drafts? Another one is when those small things, little phrases, little words kind of all add up. You've written a large, large paper, maybe it's 25 pages, maybe it's a dissertation, it's over 100 pages, and it's getting flagged because there are common words and phrases that you're using. What you can do is you can turn to the professor and ask them to use that filter that we, that we looked at and have them exclude any sources under five words. What that means is it's only going to bring back really full sentences that are either taken directly from another source or full sentences that have not been quoted. Sometimes we'll notice that a student may copy and paste from Wikipedia and get a similarity report that is better, <laughs> meaning less similar, than a student who has quoted everything properly. And once again, this just comes back to us informing our professors about those filters. Hey, it looks like I got 22% 20, um, on that similarity report. Do you mind going into the filter and excluding quotations? Because that's going to show you what my independent thought really is. Now, for that student who copied and pasted, that is plagiarism. And that's a discussion that they need to have about academic integrity. And that could relate in a failure. But once again, high similarity doesn't necessarily mean that there is bad intention. And then last but not least, using a bibliography that has those foundational texts, those texts that we're using that everyone has used across the board in regards to education and technology and business, that can flag a similarity. Hey, this bibliography has been used before. All, all these other people have used these seven sources. So we can ask our professor Jews, hey, do you mind excluding quotes and the bibliography? I did use similar sources to all these other people because I'm writing my literature review and it has to be based upon those um, foundational sources. So these are four ways that often come up that trigger similarities and also ways that we can ask our professors to really support us in investigating that. Now, obviously, the pro if the professor says, you know, I don't have time to do that or I can't do that, um, we can use the filters ourselves as students and show them by creating that new report what it looks like from the report that the professor is seeing versus that new report where we're excluding the bibliography or excluding the works cited. So that wraps up um, our workshop here today. I hope that you learned something about Turnitin, not just to support yourself, but also to start a really great conversation with your professors and to look at ways in which we can improve our own writing and our own research using this tool. If you have any questions, please reach out to the Light Center, to myself, Dr. Danny Peliquin in the library, or to the Writing Center to better help you use this tool. Thank you so much and good luck with your learning.